Hello friends, my name is JJ, and on this channel we love to talk about culture and symbols, and sometimes even cultural symbols. So let us take a little trip around the world and see what has been making news on this front over the last month. Our first story happened right at the beginning of January in everybody's third favorite country, Australia. <laughs> Apparently, in the Australian political system, the Prime Minister gets to unilaterally change the words to the national anthem whenever he wants. And this is precisely what Prime Minister Scott Morrison did on New Year's Day. The Australian national anthem, which is called Advance Australia Fair and not Waltzing Matilda, as many of us non-Australians often believe, opens with this line. Australia. Did you spot the problematic part? It is the word young. Activists have argued that this sort of language is colonialist since it plays into traditional Eurocentric ideas that the history of a place only started when the white people arrived. Accordingly, in nations like Australia, the United States, and Canada, there has been a movement to stop referring to these countries as new or young because that's seen as insensitive to the indigenous people who have been living here for ages. Prime Minister Morrison, as a result, decided to kick off 2021 by declaring that Australians are now merely one and free. It reminds me a bit of something that happened here in Canada recently when old man Trudeau changed our national anthem so it stopped saying thy sons and now it just says all of us. And talking of Canada, our big symbolic news of the new year is actually something that hasn't happened yet but is supposed to happen any day now which is the debut of the new Canadian $5 bill. Canadian money is a lot like American money in the sense that we've had the same cast of characters on our bills for several decades now. In this case four iconic prime ministers and old Lizzie Windsor. But again, we are living in sensitive times and as a result there has been a growing movement to get beyond this and have our money celebrate a more diverse assortment of Canadians rather than just the same five guys forever. In 2018, the Canadian $10 bill was the first to be redesigned and now features Viola Desmond, a woman somewhat loosely associated with the fight for racial equality in Canada. And we have been promised that sometime in the next couple of weeks a redesigned fiver will be dropping too. And in order to drive up public Public hype, the government says that the new person on the bill will be one of these eight notable Canadians. But realistically, it will almost certainly just be this guy, Terry Fox, who the polls show is the overwhelming preference of the public. Terry Fox was a disabled cancer activist who became famous in the early 1980s for his Marathon of Hope. Today he is revered as an almost saintly figure in Canada, and because he died young, there's basically nothing controversial about him. The people he is competing with, by comparison, are all extremely obscure, and in my opinion are only being suggested so that the government can get some easy credit for theoretically considering a bunch of people of color and women for the honor as well. But it would legitimately be quite shocking and even provoke a fair bit of national outrage if they didn't give it to Terry, so this might wind up being one of the biggest Canadian non-events of the year. Fun fact, Terry Fox is actually from the same part of British Columbia where I grew up and is even buried in the same cemetery as my grandparents. So. How do you like me now? So we are big fans of flags on this channel. So now let us talk about President Joe Biden's big January 20th inauguration spectacle, which was one of the flaggiest in US history. Because of COVID, the usual inauguration crowd on the National Mall was replaced with a big display of 191,500 state flags representing all of the Americans who couldn't be there in person. And why such a weirdly specific number, you ask? Well, I am afraid I don't know. There are 50 states and six territories, so you would assume that 191,500 would be divisible by 56 in some way, since based on the aerial photos, it looks like every place got an equal number of flags. But it also looks like more than two thirds of the total flags were just standard US flags. So what proportion of the total flags would have to be American flags in order for each state and territory to receive an equal number of flags? Write your answers in your copybooks now. Over on the presidential dais, meanwhile, there were five big American flags, as is tradition. And you might notice that four of the five are done up in an unusual style. I never really thought much about this until a viewer let me know the significance, which is actually pretty cool. So the edge flags are the so-called Betsy Ross flag, the somewhat mythological first flag of the independent United States 
with 13 stars in a circle, representing the first 13 states. The middle flag, meanwhile, is of course just the current US flag with the 50 stars. But what about these ones here? Well, these are actually special custom presidential flags designed to honor the specific person who is becoming president. It is supposed to be a replica of whatever flag was being used when the new president's home state first joined the US. So when George W. Bush was sworn in in 2001, the flags had 28 stars because he was from Texas and Texas was the 28th state to join the union. And then when Barack Obama became president, the flags had 21 stars because he was from Illinois and Illinois was the 21st state. Well, I mean, Obama was actually born in Hawaii and just moved to Illinois later, but I guess they went with Illinois because Hawaii was the 50th state to join, and it would have been boring if they had three 50-star flags. Trump and Biden, meanwhile, caused similar issues because they were both from one of the original 13 states, so it seems like they should have just had for Betsy Ross flags. But instead, they decided to mix it up by using two alternative 13 star flags with the stars in a field instead of a circle. The other bit of flag news following the inauguration was the question of whether or not President Biden would resume the practice of flying the so-called POW flag from the White House roof, something the Trump administration had quietly stopped doing. I talked a bit about the POW flag in an award-winning video I made a while ago about obscure American flags. And since I made that video, I have been a little bit taken aback to learn just how ubiquitous that flag is in many parts of America. Indeed, in many parts of America, you could very easily argue that it basically functions as the country's second official flag, given it is required by law to be flown everywhere the US flag is. The politics of this are somewhat complicated and I won't get into it here, but there are definitely people who think that since this flag debuted in the 1980s, reverence for it has gone too far and should be ratcheted back a bit, given, you know, that it is not the American flag. This was presumably the Trump administration's logic for removing it from the White House last June, though this act didn't go unnoticed and now there is this bipartisan coalition of senators spanning everyone from Tom Cotton to Elizabeth Warren who are demanding the new president put it back ASAP. If you're an American, let me know where you fall on this particular debate. All right, now let us move from a celebration of democracy to a celebration of tyranny, which I will kick off by asking this question. What is Kim Jong-un? I mean, obviously he is the totalitarian dictator of North Korea and an evil tyrant who has contributed to the suffering of millions. He is also a morbidly obese man-child whose inherited access to nuclear weapons is, in the opinion of Barack Obama, the defining geostrategic challenge of our time. But like, what is he? What is his actual job. Viewers of an award-winning video I made a million years ago will know that North Korea does not have a president, having abolished that position in 1994 following the death of their first tyrant, Kim Il-sung. And if you read the news, you will sometimes see references to North Korea's prime minister or head of state, neither of whom is Kim Jong-un. So what is he then? Well, on January the 10th, the world finally got its answer. Kim Jong-un is now the general secretary of the Communist Party of North Korea. Anyone familiar with communism will know that general secretary of the party tends to be the standard title for rulers of communist countries. Stalin and Brezhnev and Gorbachev and the rest of that crowd were all general secretaries of the Soviet Union, for instance, and the leaders of China and Vietnam use that title as well. So why wasn't it a thing in ultra commie North Korea until now? Well, it used to be. The previous two heads of North Korea were both general secretaries, but when Kim Jong-un came to power in 2011, he got a different title. If you look at one of those giant novelty letters he sent to President Trump, you can see he signs them as Chairman of the State Affairs Commission. But now, nine years into his rule, Kim has finally upgraded his title to match his dad and grandfather. And the thinking among North Korea watchers is that this is just some sort of bizarre rite of passage for dictators in their culture. A sort of North Korean Kim era, if you will. Kim's title upgrade was also accompanied by the hanging of this new portrait in the North Korean parliament, which seems to imply he may soon be changing his official leader's outfit as well. All right, on a lighter note, now let us get away from the world of politics and talk about something that is strictly cultural, which is to say this photograph out of Great Britain, which already seems on track to become one of the most iconic British photos of this decade. Now, I had honestly never seen this photo before, but apparently it has spent much of the last year being a subject of enormous joking and mockery and parody from the Brits, 
because of how well it functions as an artifact of contemporary British culture. So the British kind of have a long running obsession with identifying, naming, and stereotyping members of their various social classes, particularly gross or weird lower class people. It's almost Dickensian really. And accordingly, the reason this photo seems to have taken off the way it did was because it is just seen as such a perfect depiction of a sort of person who the British call lads. In fact, the standard name of this photo is just four lads in jeans, as if that explains everything. From what I understand, in modern British culture, a lad is a sort of trashy lower class person who thinks they're much cooler than they are. A guy who spends a lot of time at the club and drinking and hitting on women and stuff. And they tend to look like this with the haircuts and the tattoos and the weirdly out of proportion muscles and a taste in fashion that as one of my British friends described, looks like they've fallen headfirst into Top Man and rolled around until something stuck. People have put all sorts of captions on this photo about sort of things that these kind of guys might say and photoshopped them into all sorts of goofy scenes. And now a year after they first went viral, the British press has been hounding them for interviews, reflecting on their year of infamy. The meme got a fresh burst of life recently when it collided with another British viral sensation that I think we are perhaps a little bit more familiar with on this side of the pond, the sea shanty craze. Now, personally, I have always hated sea shanties because they remind me of this elementary school teacher I once had from Newfoundland who would always make us sing them in order to learn more about her dumb province's hick culture. But now, thanks to a fad started by a young British mailman on TikTok, everyone and their dog are belting out these a melodic ditties about whale murder and poop decks. And so naturally, it was just a matter of time before we got this. May the man come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. So let me know in the comments if there are any other weird little cultural or symbolic moments that have occurred around the world recently or are going to occur sometime soon. Until then, I will see you next week. Will a man come to bring us sugar and tea and rum? One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. Before the boat had had the water.